good afternoon, evening, wherever you are. So this is Harry, the learning difficulty expert, and I'm back after two or three weeks break because my 92-year-old mum moved on and she's no longer with us. So I need a bit of space to get on top of that. And with me, I've got Sally, the wonderful Sally. Hiya, Harry. And yes, our thoughts have been with you during these challenging times. But yeah, so no small steps. We'll get there. But uh, yeah, it's hi, all everyone. Good. Hmm. It's all good. It's part of life. Um, birth and death. And taxes. Uh, They're the three predictables. <laughs> and prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? I haven't heard of prostitution. Life, death, well, can, taxes and prostitution, okay. <laughs> no, no one's made it illegal and alcohol probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good to see you laughing. So what are we chatting about today, Harry? We're talking today about uh, something close to each of our hearts, I think, is the Generation Snowflake. Oh. <laughs> and I've titled my take on this, Toughen Up, Generation Snowflake, Toughen Up. <laughs> And or I'm, man up, as my daughter would say. Oh, man up, yeah. Well, I've got suck it up, sweetheart. <laughs> so yeah. we're talking about building resilience with our cotton wool kids in today's age. And so we're talking particularly about millennials mm -hmm. who became adults after 2010. Yep. So this is, if this is your generation, this is a good time to listen. Or if you're a parent of somebody in this generation, yeah. this is a good time so to listen. So that's eight years old or less. Yeah. No, they became adults. After oh, adults. right. Okay, so I just want to clarify that. Okay, so became, an adult yeah. as in 18 or over. Well, yeah, around about that. Yeah, yeah right. when, okay. Whenever you take the age of adulthood. Yeah, right. So they're, they're now, they're going through tertiary education yeah. now yeah. or they're starting, starting to enter the workforce. Yeah, completely different mindset from when I was going through it and then when you were going through it as well. So... Yeah. I mean, when did you leave home, Harry? I left home. Well, look, I had the most wonderful cook on the planet. Oh, mom. And your mummy's boy. We, <laughs> we, we couldn't go out to a restaurant and eat better than mum. Yeah, right. Number one. Number two, it was fun and cosy at home. So I didn't leave home because it was discomfort. It was, it was comfortable. So I left home when I finished uni at 23. Wow. And went into state for my first job. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I was 17 because I, I finished school early, went to uni, yeah. in and out of uni and in and out with dad. But um, I couldn't wait to get out of home. And, you know, I had three jobs throughout school just to save up some cash, yeah. jumped on a plane yeah. as soon as I turned 21 and backpacked for three years. I could not wait to get out and just be independent and look after myself. And, uh, yeah. Yours, you know, save and travel, or you know, just yeah. looked after yourself. But I mean, I don't know what the stats are regarding the average age of people leaving home these days, but it's well in the 30s. It is, and and I think that's driven by the cost of housing. Oh, yep. Yeah, but to get back to um, to get back to you know what makes somebody in the snowflake generation, what what makes somebody a snowflake, it is that first of all they're fragile. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they're thin-skinned, so easily upset. Yep. And thirdly, they have trouble coping with a view that doesn't match their own. Right. Right. So we see on some universities where people, like in Australia, Jermaine Greer is asked not to attend a writer's festival because she might upset somebody. Really? Might upset somebody. Are we becoming too politically correct? Or we're thinking about somebody like Bettina Arndt, who's a sex therapist, mm -hmm. who is told not to attend, not to get on the podium because she might upset somebody. Oh, man. Freedom of speech. What happened there? Yeah. It's, oh. it's an attack on freedom to speech. Definitely. So, um, you know, the Financial Times, well, yeah. you know, it's my daily reading, obviously, <laughs> in 2016 defined... Um, Snowflake as a derogatory term for somebody deemed too emotionally vun vulnerable to cope with views that challenge their own particular views in universities and in other forums, once known as places of robust debate. Wow, wow. So what happened to resilience? You know, some of these core personality traits. 
Well, I think, you know, university administrators are becoming increasingly sensitive to what's politically correct. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a dispute in the uh, University of Sydney about the Western Civilization course funded by the Ramsey organization, I think. Mm -hmm. um, who is it? Ex-Prime Minister is in, is in that. So, so there's a lot of preemptive banning of ideas and views in what were considered to be top universities. Yeah. It's so pretty. Yeah, it's um surprising. I was looking at this from a bit of a different angle, but it was just about the way um you know these teenagers or young adults think about things, their their views on everything, and not having the confidence to express their own thoughts or stand tall and um be confident in what they're feeling and thinking and then saying it. So um, in many ways, it's you're, you're not encouraged to do that. And uh, yeah. And where do you think that has its genesis? Well, there's that fear and anxiety of what, what may be standing out. I don't know. I don't, it's interesting. I mean, I think, I think it's got, got to be found in the family, the way they were brought up. Yes, yes. Our expectations and um, behavioural, you know, standards. Modelling, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, a little bit in the old way seen but not heard, but in in um, modern day version mm. of that. Yeah. So, I mean... Social media, maybe social media's got a role to play in this. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Because, you know, we didn't have all of that influence when we were at that stage. And um, Thank goodness. we didn't have like a paper trail. We didn't have Facebook and we didn't have internet or whatever so that it wouldn't last with you for life. So, you know, I know I say to my kids, you've got to be careful about what you put out there because it's always there. Absolutely. My goodness. <laughs> I've had to train my kids in, yeah, that picture probably shouldn't go up on Facebook. <laughs> Maybe you need to take it down. It's not that funny. <laughs> well, it's true because, you know, when you're going for a job these days, the um, employees go through you know, your Facebook and check for any history or pictures or whatever. I know of a number of cases of people didn't get jobs because of, you know, pictures on Facebook. Quite scary. Yeah, but, um, yeah I mean, I th that Claire Fox wrote a book called I Find That Offensive. Right, yeah. About, about this generation. And she argues that this generation was mollycoddled. Yeah. Look, they're driven to school. They don't walk to school. They don't bike to school. They don't... It's just the cotton wool kids off. thing. I they know. Don't climb trees because they might fall off and hurt themselves, poor little darlings. But it's also a safety issue. And it's also, um, you know, they have a lot more pressure on them to have more books, have all their sporting gear. I know because I've got four kids and I drive them everywhere. And it's like, you know... My dad used to walk to school in the snow and I used to walk a kilometre just down to get down to the train station, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, it is a different society and safety is, is also a big issue as well. So Do you think it's less safe now than when you were a kid? Oh, 100% uh, less safe, 100%. Do you think so? Because I don't think that's the case. I think there's a perception that it's less safe, but actually it's probably not much oh, different. I don't know, but... Um, yeah, when you come, when you talk about the cotton wool, I think there's that fine line of, okay, it's daylight, it's during the day, that's fine, but nighttime stuff in certain areas. We're sort of inner city and I would hesitate with my kids to be in certain areas around here at nighttime. Chat. But, I mean, Jack the Ripper was around a few years ago, maybe yeah. he was living in an area like, you know, inner city. Yeah. Maybe nothing changed. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, coming back again to the parents' stuff, there's also that um, society pressure of keeping up, of being the same as the Joneses, you don't want to stand out, like, you know, what, you allow your child to, like, be out at night time and get home at 10 o'clock in public transport? Are you crazy? <laughs> you know, my kid's not going to come and stay with you, blah, blah. So, so there's this wonderful book called Free Range Kids, written by a mum in America, and she was in... One in the American department stores, maybe Bloomingdale's, say, I can't remember. And the child was bored, was in the women's, women's rear department. So, so the mum <coughs> gave her a, a train fare and she went back home on the subway alone, a young child. Mm. 
and she became a cause celeb because on the one hand people were aff affronted by this small girl going through the subway completely unharmed and getting home in one piece and on the other hand people were applauding her and saying wonderful you know you're building a resilient kid so it polarized people that was the interesting thing yeah yeah it does polarize you absolutely spot on um what was that beautiful movie with that little Indian kid who fell asleep on the train and he was out with his brother and then he had to find his yes, that, was in, or... that was incredible, wasn't it? Wasn't I can't remember the name. And from Tasmania. He was with a foster family down in Tasmania. And, um, yeah, it was yeah. one of the best movies and best books read the whole lot. But, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he survived. <laughs> he survived. Mm. So, so one of the things that I've dug up is that um, that the Center for Disease Control in the U.S., who collects some of the best stats around, between 2010 and 2015, the the suicide rate went up 31 percent, 65 percent for females. This is for the teenage. Yep. generation yep. and 33 percent increase in severe depression yep and, and one of the one of the one, one of the thoughts about why this might happen is is about screen time mm -hmm. and there was another study that showed that teens who spent more than five hours a day on devices yep that's a lot more than five hours a day yep nearly half of them demonstrate, demonstrated suicide-related behaviour. Right. That was a study by Twinge et al. And, and I saw a kid um, this week, yet I won't name him, he had a wonderful musical name, Welsh name, and um, he was a teenager. He spends six hours plus a day mm -hmm. on screen, his school holidays, at least two hours a day during the term. Yep. We talked about that with his mum. His family has a history of depression and anxiety, and guess what? He's anxious. Yep. Any surprise? It's not a surprise to me. Yep. So I'm reminded about a, a, something my father said to me on the eve of my marriage. My father was a wise man. Mm -hmm. he, was, he said, a tree survives in a storm only because it flexes in the wind. I would stake a sapling and it'll fail in the strong wind. So... If you don't learn to flex when you're young, then you know you're going to. Can you repeat that? Because I've only heard that first part. Harry, a what? tree survives in a storm because it flexes in the wind. Overstake a sapling, and it will fail in a strong wind. Wow, I love that. Yeah, yeah I love that. Yeah, that's beautiful. It was. So I wonder. I wonder whether the parents allow their kids to make mistakes. Yeah, well, that's, that's also a really good point because all these addictions that kids are developing or teenagers or whatever are, are usually ways to cope with stress. So, you know, it's their outlet. And so, there, as you said, there's been a decline in health and wellbeing in young people with the increased depression, emotional instability, mental illness, and then linking in with the diet, the obesity, and then there's, you know, low social competence of, you know, being able to entertain people and not, you know, and then it's building in with all of the um, addictions, which really, which really. And you see, you, you see that in the group around the age of your children. Oh, totally, mm -hmm. totally. I, you know, I'm struggling with my own kids, so it's it's something very real and true to me. So, you know, yeah. it's not an easy thing because, and it's also very difficult to relate in some ways. You put yourself in their shoes, but just when you go. It can be so much better because it was different for us. But, um, you know, the whole smartphones, internet, you know, Fortnite, this stupid game, iPads, all that sort of stuff are just so destructive. And, um, yeah. Do you know something, Sal? Since, since my mum passed, I haven't played a single video game. Harry, I didn't even know you were into them. <laughs> oh, not much. I had a couple on my phone, you know, solitaire and stuff. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You'd be the solitaire. But I haven't, I haven't done it at all. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Interesting. It is interesting. So, you know, I had some little tips of how to cope and manage with the pressures of modern day life for, it's for anybody, but particularly for, you know, young adult 
young adults that are just starting out to really form some good basis moving forward in their life. One of them is just let stuff go, let go of the fears and the worry and the anxiety and the expectations and everybody at them. You know, stand in your own power and let all that other stress go because it, it just starts building up and building up. And the second thing is trusting themselves in their own abilities, trust their gut, trust their intuition, you know, just be led by it by within themselves and have that confidence within themselves. And the third one, which is leading into the confidence, believe in yourself and believe in the future that you want to create. And it's all possible. And, and when you believe in yourself, you speak your truth and you're standing in your power, you're feeling empowered and you're not so stressed about what other people are going to think. And, you know, that's come with, you know, years of living, I suppose, and experience and knowledge and wisdom for both of us. But if we can impart these sort of skills or um, virtues, whatever, into kids these days, it will make for a much better basis for them and also for their parenting skills. You know, letting mm, absolutely. Not being so stressed out about, about others' expectations and demands on themselves. So, yeah, that was my little thought. I think you certainly, you certainly walk the talk there, Sally, with those three. You know, dude, this, this is how I live my life. I let yeah. you go. I trust with my gut, my intuition. I just base everything on trust and, you know, believing in myself. And it's not an easy process, but the more you do it, the easier it becomes. <laughs> I believe in you. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I love it. And I can feel it. It's about feeling. It's not just saying these words. It's feeling the words, just really feeling it. And then... But no, knowing it in here, isn't it? Inside. In here. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, totally. <laughs> In your heart. So I, at, you know, one of the, I had a couple of things to suggest. One is in, endorse with your kids that it's okay to, to make mistakes. Yep. To take risks and to, and to bear the consequences and model that. Yep. Don't, you, don't just allow them to do it. Show them how to do it. Yep. Then the second thing I think is very important is to enforce boundaries and values. Yep. So this is what we do in this house. These are the values that we have. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is, is to encourage and also model to express your feelings and emotions freely. So Very not to bottle things up. Yeah. We don't want any emotional constipation. Definitely not. <laughs> no, I love that. No emotional constipation. And I think what you said before, Harry, was really important. It's really important to fail fast. So, like, get out there because none of us are perfect and we learn from our mistakes as, as experiences. So, fail fast. Give things a go. And then, mm. you know, as you said, you know, live within the standards of what you, you're enforcing in your environment or in your, you know, family life or whatever it is. And no emotional constipation. I love that. <laughs> Say it how it is and how you feel. So, one of the things I did as a kid, I was at... Um... Yeah, it was my first car, sec my second car. And I thought, geez, cars look boring. So I painted my car multicolours. <laughs> was that back in the 70s in the days of the hippies? Peace, man. <laughs> it was, it was, it was. A combi yeah. van? <laughs> but I, it was actually a, bit, a bug. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. But, you know, I had the freedom to do that. Got yeah. out of my system. Not quite. I did it twice. <laughs> <laughs> At least you didn't have a sin bin. <laughs> Oh, maybe later I did. <laughs> did you really, Harry? Did you really have a sin bin? I had a Ford Escort, <laughs> which I bought second hand. It had a 1600 GT motor in it. You could rub a strip all the way. <laughs> and the, um, the bonnet had, you know, twin um, leather straps to keep it down. It, was, <laughs> it went that. like a rocket. I love those little straps. They were the best. They were the best. You could get up to 100 and what was then 100 miles an hour really quick. Wow. <laughs> my money experience of a fast car, so expensive to maintain it. Oh, my gosh. A lot of my friends had rotaries. Do you remember rotaries? They sounded really noisy. Uh, <laughs> they always blew up, didn't they? The motors blew up. Yeah, yeah. Always yeah. in the most, you know, worst time of night, you know, far away from home, <laughs> that sort of yeah. stuff. But, um, yeah, I've really enjoyed this topic, Harry, because it's... it's good. Topical, I think. Topical. It's topical. And... You know, if we can encourage and help others just at that particular age to find their feet and empower themselves, and then, you know, they, they're really in good stead for their future, and particularly for, as role models for their children, 
sort of breaking the mold. As you say, it's a it's a particular age group that it's just that group coming through as we all go through in different eras. So you know that's some of the challenges that they're facing. And I think it's the it's the years before while they're still at home with you mm -hmm. when you're around the table at dinner where you have that opportunity to yeah to have that free play of ideas and to you know honor an idea honor other people's ideas and others views even if you don't agree with them but let them be heard let them be listened yeah. to yeah open free discussion and it's yeah. you know very informative yeah, yeah. Fantastic. But but you've got to be sitting around the table, the same table for dinner. <laughs> no, you can't be remote. You can't be FaceTiming from one bedroom down to the lounge room to the table. Yes, no, exactly. <laughs> Each on a different yeah, screen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I guess back to eating together, really important. Yeah, yeah, He's right, spot on. All righty. Well, should we wind it up there, darling? And we'll, we'll have yep. a Sounds good. Together. Sounds it's good. It's been wonderful reconnecting with you, Harry. After yeah. Same here, Sal. Yeah. <laughs> Miss you heaps. <laughs> okay. All right, darling. Well, we'll catch everyone next week. And, um, Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Hang loose in the meantime. <laughs> okay. Bye. All right. See you, babe. Bye.